Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for coming and I hope that as busy as tonight's going to be, I hope that you all find it useful and you get something out of it, if not many things out of it. Um, we're going to be covering a lot of things in this lecture. Um, I tend to go through all of these different things when in, I'm in a more of a tutorial setting. So this will be a lot more me talking at you, which is not usually what I like to do. But the aim is that all of these things, you then get a chance to practice in the workshop that I've written for just afterwards. So all of this, you can you know, get the concepts and then we'll put it all into practice straight afterwards, okay? Um, just some things that I know people sometimes want covered, things like finances and all that sort of thing. You're gonna get a whole thing on that at some point later in the year. We're not gonna talk about that. And I'm not going to go through documentation in any particular sort of detail other than occasionally referring to it on other things. But that's something that um, I hope that you guys all pick up from going around with your interns and residents on the wards. So a quick disclaimer, everything in here is based on my uh, learning that I've had, on my experience, on my exposures and is my own personal opinion. It is in no way an all-inclusive talk, nor is it the one and only way of doing things. But I hope that it gives you an approach um, so that when you hit the wards next year, you've got a structure that you can fall back on. So um, let's just start with my top tips, top tips of internship um, with a little cartoon to keep your eyes interested. Um, and that is that I know a lot of people when you go into internship, you worry about the clinical side of things of, oh goodness, I don't know the management of insert rare condition here. How am I going to be a doctor? Um, when really, unfor unfortunately, the large majority of the work is going to be paperwork, newsflash. So being efficient is actually one of the most important things you can do. The clinical stuff will come later. So the best interns are efficient, good at working in a team, good communicators, and that's communicators with people in a team, but also with patients and with families. But I think this one is really important and I hope that I'm gonna help you get a gauge of that tonight, is knowing where your strengths and weaknesses are so that you can be very confident when you're operating with those strengths. So when you're um, dealing with an issue that you know things about and you know that you're on the right track, be able to do that confidently and reliably so that the team, your team can rely on you, but also knowing when you're out of your depth and knowing when to escalate, having a good gauge of where that is and that will evolve throughout the year, I think is very, very important and makes you a very trustworthy team member. I would also say don't try and fit into the mold of what you think you need to be. It's okay to let your personality shine through and let the consultants know who you are as a person and ask them about their weekend and all those sorts of things. Don't feel like you need to do the whole med student thing of merging in the background and just doing the job. It's okay to actually, these are your colleagues now. So be a part of the team socially as well. Um, really respect and value allied health and nurses because they will be your, the, an awesome asset if you do that. Um, I've had some physios that have that I've just sort of bounced ideas off that have really really helped with certain situations So they are great and also they talk so be nice <laughs> um, Drop the ego um, A lot of there are a lot of things that a lot of people that have been working in the hospital for a lot longer than you will know um, And just because your badge says doctor doesn't necessarily mean that you know more so be open to the possibility of being wrong um, and be open to learning new things from people that are not medical as well. At the same time, you do know more than you think. And so especially when you're dealing with your consultants and with your registrars and things like that, you might have probably spent the most time out of anyone in the team with the patient. You might have done the admission, you might have seen them for five urgent clinical reviews by the time you're going to this allied health meeting. So if you know something about the patient life and people don't, then actually speak up about that because you are their best advocate from that point of view. So don't feel like because of, because of being junior, you need to be staying quiet and respecting what your elders, so to, say, so to speak, are saying. Do actually speak up. Okay, so there are some people that wanted to know a little bit about ward round prep. So very briefly, because really this is literally just about making yourself efficient on the ward round. Get a handout from the night before and then just help yourself do the job when you get to the ward round as quickly as you can. And that means stocking up on all the relevant things that you're going to need during the ward round. So blood slips, radiology slips, if you're in a hospital that does paper 
charts, then drug charts, paper scripts so that you can even do a discharge script on the round, all those sorts of things. Make sure you've got the lists for all the team members, all the basic sort of stuff like that you guys would have already been helping out with in plenty of time. My approach to task prioritization, I think people make this out to be way more complicated than it needs to be. I think really this is just about keeping track of everything. And I mean doing this, like really, really keeping track of everything and then just focusing on the most urgent tasks. Simple as that. And that I think is a good approach to task prioritization. Um, and the things that you need to do urgently, the things that are important to do now, are the things that are obviously clinically urgent. So if there's a met call, if someone's deteriorating, those sorts of things. If someone needs an urgent CT scan, if you're on the surgical rotation and someone's bleeding, all those sorts of things, those are right now tasks. The other ones are the ones that are actually just quick and convenient. Nurse comes up to you and goes, oh, this patient's run out of morphine on their PRN chart. Can you just rechart it in the line before? You're physically there. The chart is physically in front of your face. It will take you two seconds to do it. So that's something that's also a now job because it'll just save you time later. Um, sometimes that's not the case. If there's literally something that's, that's very clinically urgent, then that's not the case. But just keep in mind sometimes the convenience factor is important. And the other jobs to do now are the jobs that are going to help with flow. So if you know that doing this referral early in the day is going to give them plenty of time to come and see your patient so that they might be able to go home the next day, do the referral as early as you can. So the jobs that help with flow are going to be the other ones that are the early, the early jobs. So what that looks like during the day, during the ward round, obviously you're trying to keep up with the actual ward round. Keep track of all of the jobs. Have your own system for what that looks like and hopefully it's something you can develop now while you're doing your um, trainee internship. My system, if it's helpful for anyone, is I write down um, updates just on my list. Um, but if it's an actual job, I put a little box. And then if I've done something to do with that box, maybe I'll put one hash through it. If I've completely done the task, I'll put a whole cross through it. And sometimes if I know that there's something I need to follow up, I might go right next to it, little arrow, and go chase the scan, and then put an arrow in the little box. Um, so just that will help make sure that you don't miss anything because it's actually your job to make sure that nothing gets missed. Um, the, all of this you already know. You can quickly chart medications, try and get on top of discharges, do all of the, you know, protocoling the CT scan on the round, all the things that you can do now while still keeping track of the ward round. And how much you can do might change throughout the year. Earlier in the year, it might be that you just deal with the ward round and that's fine. That's all you can cope with. And then as the year goes on, you're very efficient and you do multiple things at once. Um, and get good at acronyms because it'll help you be um, better at writing notes so that you can have more time to do the rest. <coughs> Alright, um, immediately after the ward rounds, again, keep track of all the jobs and decide with your co-intern, co-resident, whoever else is around, who's going to do what and do all, as we were saying before, all of the things that are, that are the now jobs, the things that are going to be important. And then as the day's going on, again, keep track of what's been done. Check in with your co-intern, with your co-resident, what's been done, what still needs doing. Keep track of it all. New jobs are going to pop out. Write them down. Keep track of them. And then you might start to do the less urgent things like um, ordering the blood for the next day, catching up on summaries, um, and making sure that the stuff from earlier in the day has happened, um, calling up radiology if that scan hasn't happened yet and go, why hasn't happened, and that sort of thing. Okay? you will get interruptions throughout the day. And this is where internship can be really, really difficult because this is, a, this is impossible to plan for. So you're gonna get deteriorating patients that are gonna completely interrupt your day. You're gonna get patients and families asking for updates, which although it is a very rewarding part of medicine, being able to be the person that explains what is going on to a very anxious family, when you are the very, very busy intern that has 50,000 other jobs to do and is already stressed, your reaction to that page is, Ugh! and I hate that that becomes your reaction, but it does become your reaction. It will happen. So you're going to get this situation happen. And it takes a long time out of your day, but it's an important part of the day as well. You're going to get nurse interruptions, asking you to chart various things, asking you that they're worried about a patient, clarifying a plan that you've already documented, all of those sorts of things. It, managing that side of things is the thing that's going to take you from um, an intern that's just starting off to a really competent intern at the end of the year. And my big tip for those would be to try and differentiate between the things that fall in the do it now category 
um, whether it be either just that they're quick and convenient or clinically necessary to do them now, or which ones you can just be like, yep, noted, I will put this on my list, keep track of it, and I will come around to it if there's time, and just um, get the expectations right, saying that might not be today, right, for the really non-urgent things. You're going to get a lot of interruptions. <laughs> Nothing like a good meme, right? All right. Um, I just want to have a quick thing about dealing with really angry and upset patients. Because I feel like that's something that you probably shy away from a lot as a student and then suddenly as the intern, it's your job to deal with them. Um, and also because it's something that if you do well, can really offload your registrar. Um, if it's something that it doesn't even escalate to that point because you've dealt with the issue, it can be really, really helpful in a team. So um, what I do and what I find has helped really well, um, obviously this is an aggression situation, code grey, all that sort of stuff, and that's a different story. But if we're just talking about, you know, family member is upset and, and just doesn't understand what's going on, Take, actually take the time, it will actually make the interaction go faster and be more efficient. Take the time to sit down, do the whole leaning forwards thing, don't do the arm um, crossing over, I don't want to be here thing, do the whole, you know, I'm here to listen, you know, pose and face and all of that. And spend the majority of your time acknowledging what they're saying and validating it rather than trying to defend yourself. I had a patient once who was almost yelling at me, he was so annoyed because we'd spent a week with throwing different diagnoses around. And I was there being like, we think it's endocarditis. And he was just like, you guys don't know what you're saying. And I just went, yep, that's fair enough. Yep, that's really frustrating. I know it's been frustrating for us as well. It's been really vague symptoms that you've had. Yep, I get it. That makes sense. Yep, your, your emotions make sense. All of this, and he just de-escalated in front of my eyes. It works. Do this, it works. And then, um, and don't, don't blame other team members for anything. And sometimes patients or families will say, um, you know, that nurse made a mistake for that or that doctor told me this. Don't blame other team members. The whole hospital, you're all in it together. Okay, don't fall into that trap. Just go into the, I'm sorry that's been your experience. I'm sorry that happened. And move on to the explaining part of things, which is, this has been what's happened since you've been here and this is why it's been frustrating because this is how it's been diagnostically uncertain or we've had this theatre cancellation or, you know, these other things have happened that have made it frustrating and I'm really sorry. This is what we're doing now. This is why it's not clinically urgent that we do this thing, therefore it's safe to wait and this is the plan over the next few days. Are you happy? Great, move on. You've just saved your edge a whole bunch of time. Um, who to call? <laughs> true, true life. Um, this, this is actually very legit. This is actually what happens. So don't feel bad when you don't know something because the reality is probably the HMO doesn't know, probably the resident, the reg doesn't know, and probably the consultant's going to have to ask two other consultants. So it's okay that you don't know and it's okay to escalate things. Um, during the day, I'm sure you will know who the people are that you can ask, but here are a few different options. That changes a little bit when you're on cover after hours, but there's always someone around you can ask. And that's something that I really want us to practice in the workshop after this, is don't use your tutors as the person you ask. Think, okay, if I were alone, who would I ask and say, I want to call the periop med range and speak to your tutor as they are the periop med range, like you're actually doing a referral. I want you to take them out of that safety blanket situation of uh, being able to ask someone and deal with it the way you would actually deal with it. Okay. A um, couple of things with working with a co-intern. Um, and once again, can you tell that I like organization? Keep track of jobs and make sure that you're both doing that and that you're both keeping track of the jobs as you go and keeping track of each other. This can sometimes be tricky if you're the more organized of the two and you're constantly needing to check in with your co-intern. But if you've got two that work really well, I had one co-intern where we thought the same, our brains worked the same. We were constantly like on top of everything and whenever one person would think of a job, the other person had already done it. That is a great co-intern situation and it's because of good organisational skills and keeping track of things and good communication so that you're not doubling up on things. Um, 
Another thing is taking turn doing different things as well. So one day you might be the one carrying the pager and dealing with all those interruptions that we were talking about while the other person is trying to just get onto the more non-urgent things but that just need to get done at some point and then swap the next day, that kind of thing. And just have, have a dynamic relationship where you might be like, okay, I'm, I'm really feeling overwhelmed by doing this, can we swap for the afternoon and then we'll do it tomorrow, something like that. And make sure you support each other and that your co intern is going on their half day when it's their turn and all those sorts of things. Make sure you're a team. Okay, referrals. Um, my biggest tip for referrals is to flag early what you want out of that conversation. A lot of bad referrals are the kinds of referrals where the person is waiting at the end of the line for you to get to your point. And they're getting bored, they're wondering what this whole conversation's about, they've got 15 other th things that they're supposed to be doing. So tell them really early what the key features are and what you want out of this conversation. It's not ISBA, the request comes at the front, okay? You say that first. So um, I would suggest actually reorganizing the whole ISBA thing into a one sentence summary that you open with, because then you've got time to take a step back and go back to the history from the start, because they already know what you're wanting out of this conversation. So hi, I'm Manon, I'm the uh, spinal intern. I'm calling about a 58 year old man who's got worsening neurology on a background of a spinal condition um, in the context of whatever else, okay? And I want your opinion or I would like you to see the patient. Just tell them very quickly what you would like at the start and then you can go back and go, okay, this is the past history, this is, the, you know, that's relevant and then this is what they initially presented with, the course has been a little bit like this, all of this has happened, complicated by this, now we're getting to this and in the context of that, not sure what's going on, we thought we'd ask you for help. That whole thing is a whole lot less boring and they get where you're going with it and they're following you because you've told them they're at the start what you want out of this and what the actual issue is. So then they've got that frame of mind while they listen to the rest of the story and can go, okay, cool, All right, let's, let's do this. Or yes, I'll come see the patient, okay? <coughs> yeah. um, this is from Beauty Within Medicine, which is another version of that. I just thought it was quite a nice graphic, so sharing it with their permission. It's on their Facebook. Couple of tips for difficult referrals, because there will be some, is make sure you actually know what the question is before calling, so that when you're doing that little one sentence summary thing, you're not just kind of going, actually, what do I want out of this? So make sure you know what the question is first. And if you don't understand what that is, ask your registrar first. You're like, sorry, why are we speaking to gastro? What, what's the actual question and why can't we deal with it? Okay, cool. Um, and make sure that you know the details of the case. Uh, at the start of the year, I'd suggest having all the bloods in front of you, having the folder in front of you, trying to make sure you've got all the resources there. And then as you progress throughout the year, you can do it on the fly a lot more, okay? Um, also make sure you've met the patient because sometimes on some of the really busy teams, <laughs> you might've been off doing a job when that patient was seen on the ward and you haven't physically met the patient. And some registrars know this and they'll be like, what's the body habitus of the patient? Like, oh, I have not met the patient. <laughs> so make sure you've met the patient. Um, but also advocate for your patient because the majority of the time you have met the patient and you know this patient a whole lot better than the person you're referring to. So advocate for them. You're getting some pushback. Just because you're junior doesn't mean you can also do a little bit of pushback as well. You know this patient, they don't. They haven't met them. So... Um, I remember being on a 10 minute conversation arguing with an infectious diseases consultant about a patient in spinal that definitely needed antibiotics. And when we spoke to a different infectious disease consultant who knew the patient said, oh my God, of course. So you know your patients better. But also don't lie. Um, they will be able to tell um, if you don't know something, if you don't know a case, if you don't know a detail about the case, just say so and just say, not sure, haven't asked them, sorry, let me go find out. They will respect that a whole lot better than you sort of going, yeah, their weight today is, uh, and just pulling you up. So don't lie. Um, and also don't take it personally. There will be days that no matter what you do, you're going to get someone who's grumpy on the other end and all that sort of stuff. And don't take it personally. It's not you. Okay. Okay. Um, we're now going to spend just 
quite a while talking about prescribing. And I wanted to focus on this for a little bit because I think this is something that you guys don't get a huge amount of practice on. You spend most of your med school getting your clinical reasoning all good, but you don't actually put pen to paper and prescribe things very much. And most of the time, we're not even talking about doses. We're just now suddenly need to know doses. So I want to spend a fair bit of time on this and give you a bit of a tool set of some of the really common things and where to go to uh, look for extra information as well. Um, you should all have a little sheet. Yeah, have you all got that little sheet of paper with all of the medications on it? Um, that's courtesy of the Northern uh, HMO Society. So they actually make this medication summary for all of their new interns, um, which is actually a really great resource. And it's a hospital that uses paper drug charts. So having something like that on the go with you is very helpful. I don't know if other places do a similar thing, but I've worked at the Northern and that's something that they use. So I will be going through that particular form a little bit in my talk. Um, just highlighting the sections that I think are useful and relevant, okay? Um, but firstly, I wanted to talk about how to actually physically write a prescription. Um, so the first thing is make sure that you've got three points of ID. And this is just, you know, medical, legally safe prescribing. Make sure you've got three points of ID. Make sure you've got a sticker on your thing. If it's electronic, it's much easier. Just make sure you've got the right patient file open, which is an important one, make sure you've got the right patient file open. But if it's a paper drug chart, make sure you've got the right sticker on, you've got your three points of ID, make sure that you write things very legibly so that the nurses don't mistake what you have written, that's very important. Sign and date everything, write maximum doses when you're writing PRNs so that there is a limit on how much opioid they're going to give or whatever it is, um, because it's on you if they've given more than that, because your order didn't have a maximum. So make sure that you would be happy with them receiving whatever the maximum is that you're writing down. So um, this is based on the Northern drug chart, but most paper drug charts are the same. And even if you're going to be going somewhere that has um, electronic prescribing next year, I think that this is a very worthwhile skill knowing how to do, either because you're going to do rural rotations where this, is, where this is used, or because later in your career you're going to go somewhere where it's paper drug charts. So I think this is useful regardless. So there's always going to be a top section with the bit where you put the sticker, the bit where you write the patient's name and the allergy bit. All of these are important. So I've got my label and then I wrote it, put the label a bit low, but then you rewrite the patient's name immediately underneath and make sure that you've got the allergies here. Nurses shouldn't actually give any medication from the drug chart unless this section has been filled out. So if you haven't put nil and signed, if there are no allergies, the nurses shouldn't actually give any of the medications that are on the drug chart. So make sure you fill in that bit and make sure you've done this and make sure you've written on it. And you've got your whole section of regular medications that should look something like this. The northern one also has this little bit that's dose per kilo, which is a highly useless section that I've never used. Most other places don't have that and it just has the dose frequency thing. And this bar is just a bit longer. So just ignore that section. Um, filled in, you've got your date, your route, signature name, etc. cetera. Um, I never feel that bit. Um, and then make sure you actually write down the times. This should come up automatically when you're doing the like electronic prescribing, but check that you're happy with the times because sometimes it'll come up with very weird ones. So you can always change what time you actually want. But when you're doing a paper drug chart, you once again, the order is not valid unless you have put times in. Most drug charts will have a section on it that suggests some times, like if it's BD, it'll be A and H, that sort of thing. So there'll be some suggested times on there um, for just the normal drug administration times. But you can also pick, like if you want it to be half an hour before the meal, you can make it at 7.30 or whatever it is. Um, it's okay when there's a fixed dose thing to put the dose in the top bit and then just say one, one inhalation, that's fine as well. You've got a few other sections in your drug charts as well. So you've got the variable dose one, which is useful to use for medications where you might not give the same dose every day. So for example, prednisolone in someone that's getting an exacerbation of COPD, or you might give three days of a higher dose and then wean down, or um, vancomycin where you might be changing levels and things like that, gentamicin, those sorts of things where you might be changing doses as you go. Electronic, it's much easier because you can just modify the order but on paper drug charts is a good place to put those sorts of things. There's also usually a section for warfarin, and we'll go through this specifically afterwards and we'll do a bit about warfarin dosing. 
Um, and then there's usually a section on VT prophylaxis, which is important to fill in regardless of whether you think Clexane is indicated or not, because if that thing goes away, there's under, if you guys will have it, there's that bit here that says mechanical, where you can actually check whether you would like them to have stockings or something else instead. Um, and you can put that on the drug chart. Um, filled in, it looks like that. So um, in this section, you only need to write daily and the t you still need to put the time, but then the dose is more of a daily thing and you just sign it underneath. Same thing with warfarin, but we'll get back to that in a sec. And then stop moving the mouse. You've got the bit below as well. Okay. Um, and then you've got your PRNs. Um, once again, same as the regular medications, you've got your um, your route, your the medication, sign date, etc. The important bits for PRNs are the route. And the great thing about paper drug charts is you can put alternate routes as well. So you can put um, oral slash subcart or um, oral slash IV for various things, which can be quite helpful. Whereas on electronic prescribing, you have to put it in as different options. Um, make sure that you actually put down the frequency. And this is particularly important when you're dealing with opioids. A good shorthand way of doing it is just Q4H, so four hourly and things like that, Q2H, whatever it is. Make sure that you fill in this bit because otherwise, technically, people could just keep on giving oxycodone. The PRN max dose, um, have a think about what you actually would like. Sometimes I don't fill it in if I would be happy with five milligrams, four hourly on the dot, I'd be fine with that. They clearly can't give any more than that the way I've written it. So I, sometimes I just can't be bothered calculating what that adds up to in 24 hours and I just leave it blank. But if you've put a range, so if you've put, you know, five to 10 milligrams for, for example, and you've made it two hourly, you might be like, oh, would I actually be happy with them getting 10 milligrams every two hours for a whole 24 hours? Probably not. Then have a think about how much you'd actually like as your maximum and write it in there. And that is the same for electronic. Actually, put there's this little box where you can do that. Put it in there. What does it mean to give a range to practice like, Who makes that decision about what dose to give? The nurses do. So they might try the lower dose first, for example, for pain, um, or for nausea, for example, if you're doing on Dancitron. They might try the lower dose first, and if it doesn't help, it actually means that they've got the room to move to add a second dose pretty much straight after, because it's even though you've made it two hourly, three hourly, whatever it is. Um, you've allowed for it to go up to 10 milligrams within that time frame. So you've allowed for them to give an extra five milligrams if the first doesn't work. So practically it ends up being a nursing decision. And then you've got your stats section. Um, this gets used a lot in ED in a lot of these places that have paper drug charts um, where ED will, instead of charting regular anything, just put a whole bunch of stat orders and it's still up to you to chart everything regularly. Um, but it's helpful for met calls or urgent clinical reviews and those sorts of things where you can just write down what you want, the dose, and I, often it'll end up being stat, but sometimes it might be pre-CT scan or, you know, if heart rate doesn't decrease down to below blah, you know, put, put your conditions on, I'm happy for you to give this extra stat dose in, in these conditions and sign up. And that's a good way of doing that. You have an option for stat orders on electronic as well. So often it's a drop down that you have to choose. Cool. Um, let's spend a little bit of time on analgesia because you're going to be prescribing analgesia a lot. You all know this. None of this is new. You know the analgesic ladder um, and you've got a few different doses on your sheets in terms of what to give. I want to spend a little bit of time actually looking at the opioids. Um, neuropathic agents, I'd rarely be starting them yourselves, but it's something that you can raise the possibility of should we add some regabalin and all that sort of thing. And obviously regional is going to be anesthetics. Opioids. These are going to be all the ones that you are going to see the most in hospital. They're not necessarily all of the ones that you need to know well. So the one, these are the ones that either the patient's going to come in on these doses or they're going to come out of theatre on these sorts of things. Um, they're going to be on the wards on these sorts of things. So morphine used in ED, used in theatre, used in all the quick care areas. Um, you're not going to be using it a huge amount as an intern. The exception maybe being the oral liquid, so the ordeen can be used for pain and it's actually used a lot in palliative care sort of situations. So end stage COPD patients with symptom relief and that sort of thing. 
Morphine's good in general because everyone's very familiar with its dosing, but you shouldn't use it in renal impairment. Oxycodone is better in renal impairment, and in fact, it ends up being the one that you use the large majority of the time. So arguably, you can actually use it even when you get towards the later stages of renal impairment. You just sort of start to halve doses. But because of familiarity, some people argue that you can use it throughout the whole range just because everyone ends up being so familiar with it that you can halve it quite safely. But fentanyl is the one that is just dead set, can use in renal failure and dialysis. The issue is that there's no oral option, it's only subcut. Codeine, you'll see, you know, especially older patients come in on it from the community. It's a terrible drug. As much as possible, I would be switching people off codeine, but you'll have some people that are just have been on it for years and swear it's the best thing ever. Um, but because it's not over the counter anymore, I think that that's decreasing a bit. So hopefully you guys see less and less codeine because it's a terrible drug. Um, it has such a variable response in absolutely everyone that uses it. Half these people will come in with codeine allergies because they had this, some bad reaction to it from being poor metabolizers, and you can't use it in real fat. It's a poor drug. Um, buprenorphine, can you stop me being nice? Buprenorphine, um, you'll see a lot of people coming in on patches. Um, so a lot, a lot of the people with chronic back pain, those sorts of things, they might be on a buprenorphine patch. It's quite useful because it's a weekly patch. Um, so a lot of people will come in on it from the community, and so you're basically just gonna be recharging that patch. Um, the short acting version is usually an acute pain service sort of thing. So you might see people on it, but you can't touch that. Leave it. Um, just realized that I didn't talk about weekly things in terms of actually prescribing it. When you write it down, just put down weekly and then just put a whole bunch of crosses in all of the days that it's not due to be changed. And then a little open box on the day that it's due to be changed. So if it ends up being weekly, but it's on a Tuesday, just go when you admit them. Okay. 12 PM. Cross, 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 Tuesday, change the patch and go from there. That doesn't make sense. Ask me later. So out of all of those, the ones that you guys should be comfortable charting from scratch would be those ones. So really, the large majority of those you're going to see, but probably not use a huge amount. So it's those ones. So your breakthrough analgesia, the large majority of the time, Endone or Oxynorm, different brand names for the same thing, depending on the hospital that you're in is going to be your best bet. You're going to get really familiar with it. You're going to get really comfortable with it. We'll go through a few different cases of using it in a sec. But so five milligrams as a starting dose is usually fine. Sometimes you might want to halve that. Um, and some people might use up to 20 milligrams as a breakthrough dose if they're really opioid tolerant. But generally, a 5 to 10 range is good for most people. The frequency depends on a lot of other things. Tarjan is the long acting, so you guys would know that that's oxycodone and naloxone as a combined medication. So the two numbers, the first one is the oxycodone comp component, the second one is the naloxone, the idea being that it antagonizes the gut effects and the constipation effect. There's actually not a huge amount of evidence for it, but we all use Tarjan. Um, and it's twice a day. Fentanyl is a really good other option to have as a PRN, especially when you're doing surge and when people are getting acute pain and you want to be able to relieve the pain quickly in people that may or may not be actually taking oral tablets, um, but also for who you'd like the onset of action to be quite quick. Um, Subcut fentanyl is quite a good option to have up your sleeve as well. And the, the sort of equivalent of the 5 to 10 would be the 25 to 50. Um, so actually putting down or as a range 25 to 50 subcut PRN for most surgical patients as a sort of second line analgesia option is not a bad way to go. In terms of dosing, some of the considerations to have, age is actually the biggest one in terms of determining opioid dosage. So a younger versus older patient is gonna be the single most important factor in deciding people's dosage and opioid requirement. But some other considerations you might have would be their body habit is the cause of their pain and most more importantly they're likely to continue to get a lot of pain so a surgical patient versus someone who's in for an investigation of heart failure you're going to be charting very different prns with narrower ranges and maybe be a bit more i mean narrower time ranges so two hourly versus six sort of thing um and you might allow for a greater dosage range as well if it's a surgical patient whereas <laughs> You might chuck in five milligrams, six hourly, if you want for a medical patient, just so it's there and you don't have to get paged for it, but really you're not expecting them to be in a huge amount of pain, right? Um, if they're up your naive versus sensitized, it's obviously gonna make a big difference. The five milligrams is not gonna touch someone who's already on a patch with ridiculous doses. Um, 
And the chronic pain psychiatric history sort of population is very difficult and often best left to the acute patients. So a couple of examples um, of an approach, again, there's no right answer, on approach that you might take for some of these situations. So, uh, you know, 85 year old, and I said age is important. So 85 year old frail lady from a nursing home with cellulitis. So you might expect some pain from the cellulitis. So you'd probably put the paracetamol regular. The end said, probably not in this patient. There she's old. You might put a long acting there because you do expect there to be some pain, but you'd assess that on meeting the patient as well. So you might just put a low dose of targe in their BD to prevent the need for PRNs. And you might chuck in a five milligram PRN there maybe not too frequently, but just put it in there. You could even go 2.5 to 5 there as just because of small frail. Come on. Um, 25 year old with cholecystitis, much younger patient, big reason to have pain. You might be a lot more liberal. So again, you're still gonna have the regular paracetamol. You might consider an NSAID because you're not quite as worried because they're not as old. Um, you'd put a higher dose of the Tarjan and some patients might even need 15 and 10 and your breakthrough would be both shorter in terms of how soon they're allowed to have it and you might put a bit more of a range and as I said as well you might introduce a fentanyl as an alternative option for them as well. 73 year old with an exacerbation of heart failure and a background of chronic pain and renal impairment, important, who's usually on a fentanyl patch. So there's a chronic pain history. She's not opioid naive, but she is old. Um, we don't expect her to have a huge amount of pain though. So you could put her on regular paracetamol just to avoid opioids. Um, avoid NSAIDs in her, CKD, old, no. Nah. Um, you probably don't wanna add an long acting. She's already on a patch. You don't expect her to have more pain. You probably just leave it as it is. If pain becomes a big feature, you could even just decrease her patch or just add a little bit of targeting while she's in hospital and stop her when she goes home, that sort of thing. But you might not need to do much. You can consider using oxycodone, but you'd be halving doses because of renal impairment. Or you could just have fentanyl subcut there as an option, um, really not actually expecting her to use all that much. And it might be that she doesn't even need the regular paracetamol. You could just put it on the PRN chart to begin with. And if she's using it a lot, then maybe to put it regular. No right answer. Just some suggestions of how to approach it. Any questions about that bit? You'll get some practice in the second section. You can ask all of your tutors about the specifics of that scenario as well. Antiemetics, you're really going to be using these to the large majority of the time. So metoclopramide, 10 milligrams, lots of different routes you can use. Just keep in mind a max dose for 24 hours. And on Dansetron, that has a range, so you can actually put down both. And it has a sublingual option, which can be quite useful. And some patients have had it before and they'll ask you for the wafer. Um, so that can be quite a useful route. Keep in mind that um, I think there can be sometimes a tendency to just to chuck both of them on the PRM chart and just forget about it. That's fine for most situations, but try and think about which one might be a little bit more efficient for your patient. So if it's a GI cause, metoclopramide is prokinetic, so it works really well if they've got gastric stasis, if that's that kind of GI cause of uh, nausea. Um, so might think about using that first, but it is contraindicated in a bowel obstruction. So any patient that you even suspect of having one, do not chart it. It's absolute contraindication. Um, on Dancitron works really well. It was developed for chemo and radiotherapy. So it works really well for that kind of, you know, chemoceptive trigger zone type nausea. Um, it's quite expensive. So often don't put it on a discharge script. Um, and it is actually constipating, which people often forget about. So sometimes it can be a good idea to move to some of the rarer ones that you would use in other situations. Um, but these do end up being the ones that get used the large majority of the time. So they're going to be the ones that you're the most familiar with. A lot of these other ones, um, you'd often look up on a case-by-case -case basis if, if these are not really working. Um, Semitol is the one that's most often used for vertigo, so it's a good one to know about as well. So now we'll go to the um, sheet and just kind of highlight a few different things. Um, we'll go literally in order of the sheet. So, and I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things that I think are important and just you, you guys can practice using them in the later section. So allergic reactions, obviously anaphylaxis things, 
you know that you're giving adrenaline or that sort of thing, half a vial, 0.5. Um, if people are getting, you know, a bit itchy and that sort of thing, and you get getting asked to review a patient for itch, either of these are good options. You can see that there's issues of hepatic versus renal impairment in one versus the other, but you can use either of them and they both work fine just to get rid of that sort of itch. They're both antihistamines. Um, as a general rule, don't use this, but if you really need to, you can. Um, this would be more when you get it, people are getting diarrhea as a side effect of something else rather than if it's an infective cause or those sorts of things. So it's there. As a general rule, don't use it. Um, but if someone is needing it for symptom relief for something or other, you can. Now, the respiratory side of things. Um, the top two you're going to probably use the most. So getting uh, comfortable charting salbutamol and atrovent are uh, both really helpful. So salbutamol, you can either just chart as the inhaler and you can have a range of how many puffs at once you would like them to have. And that's pretty much at your own discretion. Most of the time I put one to two because as an inpatient, unless they're in for an exacerbation of asthma, I'm not expecting them to need too much. So I would just put a range of one to two inhalations, PRN hourly. I don't know, but there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and uh, just have it on their PRN chart if, it, if, it, if they've got COPD or asthma. Um, or you can put a stat um, neb if you're reviewing someone for wheeze or something like that. So you could just put the five milligram in 2.5 mil. I wish this would move so that you guys could see it, but um, it's a neb of five milligrams in 2.5 mils. And that's a really good one to just give as a stat if you're reviewing someone for wheeze that to just settle that down as well. The atrovent you can give as well. So you can give a neb of both of them together, which can be quite helpful. So you put both of the nebulizers in the one thing, give it to the patient, get rid of all of that wheeze. You can also chuck it on the PRN chart. So again, one to two puffs, Q, whatever you want, um, and have it on their PRN chart as well. If you're giving it to them regularly, you should stop their long acting um, muscarinic. So it's a teotropium underneath it. Um, just one quick thing with those ones, salbutamol can really quickly induce tachycardia and sort of shakiness and anxiety. So it's a really, really common urgent clinical review that someone is tachycardic as soon as they come up to the ward after being admitted for an exacerbation of asthma because ED has done burst therapy and they've had, you know, 12 puffs every 20 minutes of salbutamol and they come up to the ward and their tachycardic is all hell and they're shaky and their potassium's down and their lactate's up and you're just like, okay, let's just pause on the salbutamol, let them settle themselves down and maybe just give atrovent only for weeks over the next little while until they're no longer tachycardic. Just a common thing that you might see. Is lower too, so prednisolone, just knowing that sort of a range of anywhere from 25 to 50 for exacerbations of asthma or COPD would, might be a good place to start. I'd go with 25 most of the time. I don't know why they say 30. The tab, they come in 25 milligram tablets, so it's easier. The normal saline, a pitch, quick pitch for the normal saline NEB because it is excellent. It is good for people who are short of breath, for people who have lots of secretions that they can't bring up, got a wet cough, but they can't quite cough it all the way up, who just have a sore throat that's really irritating, or for the person that you don't think there's anything freaking wrong with them, but the nurse wants you to do something, so you just give them some saline to bring them in. <laughs> the normal saline nib is excellent. <laughs> it does a lot of different things. It genuinely makes the patients feel a lot better because it can relieve all of those symptoms without any side effects. It's just, it's just water. You're just inhaling all the time. It's great. So would I'm a strong contender for the normal saline neb. Just write it down on their PRN, five mils, neb, Q, whatever you want. Um, and a lot of people that have, you know, a lot of sore throat, a lot of, you know, wet cough that they can't bring things up, I'll even write it down on their regular tr um, drug chart, even two hourly, and just get get them to give them some two hourly. And the patients just feel so much better. They don't have that, they don't have that um, sore throat as much. Um, they feel like they're able to cough up more. It actually symptomatically is a really good one. I'm on palliative care at the moment. We use it all the time. It's actually quite good for symptom relief. It doesn't do much, but it's really good for symptom relief. It makes people feel great. It makes nurses feel like you're doing something. So it's a great one to use. Would recommend. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, just a reminder, prednisolone, put it in the um, variable dose section. 
I'm not going to go through the antibiotics because I don't think this is the right way to teach antibiotics. It's much more of a thing that you do based on the indication rather than based on the medications. But I will show you where to find which one to use in what situation. So we'll skip through a lot of that. Now, um, aperients or laxatives. All of these are good. All of them. My general approach is to start by putting them PRN. So anyone who's coming in that I'm prescribing opioids, I make sure that there's at least one aperient on their PRN charge. Um, and most of the time I just look for everyone because everyone gets constipated in the hospital because they don't move and they don't eat properly. So um, most people that I make, I try and make sure that there is at least one aperient on their PRN charge. So start off there. If they haven't opened the mouth for a few days, maybe you move it from the PRN chart to the regular. So you might, if you're starting with colloxal and center at the top, which is probably where most people start, you know, you could start with one at night um, at regular and see how that goes. Next step might be to increase the regular. So you might go two at night or you might go one BD or even two BD. And you might add on a different regular one. So you might keep the two BD, but then you also add um, Movicol. I, I go Movicol second line, not Lachulose then you go mother call second line um, and put that every morning, for example, one or two sachets, just kind of gradually increase it. And then eventually you probably need to go PR. Um, and Macrolux Enema is probably a good one to start off with because it's quite gentle. It's not one of those sort of stimulant um, uh, laxatives that cause cramping and all those sorts of things. So it's quite a good one to start off with for most people. Surge so use fleet enemas a lot for the like really, really, really constipated like, people that come in under a surge team. Um, most other teams try and stay away from that because it causes a few electrolyte derangements. Um, so yeah, that's my general approach to appearance. And I'd usually go Cloxone center first line, Movicol second line, Lactulose third line. I quite like Lactulose, but it tends to make people go quite quickly and some people don't like that. Um, next section is um, sedatives. Now, Try not to use any of these, but you will. Um, the most common would be temazepam when patients just need, want something to go to sleep. So five to 10 milligrams as a nocte dose. If you can get away with it, just try charting it as a once off. Um, if the patient just really wants something for now, you know, because tonight they can't fall asleep um, because they're not great to use long term. So try if you can get away with it to just do it as a once off. But if they're, if they're asking for it every night, then you might think about putting it either regular or PRN as 10 milligrams Nocte. So it can only be given once at night by the nursing staff, PRN. Um, I had a reg who had a really good rule about temazepam. Her rule was, and she would talk to the patients about this. She would say, these are not great to rely on and they're not great to use long-term. Um, as a general rule, I will put this on your PRN chart, but you can't have it two nights in a row and you can't have it more than twice a week. I quite liked it as a way of sort of saying, yep, this is something that I'm happy to help out with, but I don't want you to rely on this. Let's have a chat about appropriate use of temazepam. And her rule was not two days in a row, not till more than twice a week. I kind of like that. Um, these ones are for the code gray agitated patient that you need to settle down. It is not first line, it is like fifth line. You, you know, you call the code gray, you've got the people there to help settle down the patient. You do all of those, you know, calming, posturing, quiet voice. A lot of the times these are delirious patients who are really demented and all those sorts of things. And just the soothing tone is gonna help a lot more than anything that you actually say. Um, and just reorientation, getting them back to bed, all of that sort of thing. If you really need to, if they're being a bit dangerous, getting security to actually bring them back into their room and those sorts of things. If you absolutely need to, give them something I am to settle them, but really try and make this one of the last things you do when you absolutely have to. It's not good for the patient and it's not a great thing to do and it doesn't actually feel good to do. Um, most people go with a lanzapine as their first line one, so 2.5 either oral as a wafer if the patient will take it or otherwise as an IM injection. I've used haloperidol a fair bit purely because that was the first one that one of my regs sort of introduced me to and that I used in that context. So just familiarity ends up being a bigger factor. Um, both of them have their own sets of issues. They all do, which is why you shouldn't use them first or even second line. Um, you'll end up getting comfortable with whichever one you get exposed to using first. Um, but yeah, my biggest thing here is try not to use them at all. 
Um, anticoagulants, we're going to go through warfarin in detail in a second. Um, just quickly with Clexane charting. So you guys would all know that we try and put the most people in hospital on prophylactic um, and that's 40 milligrams the large majority of the time, just as a daily subcut injection. But if your patient has renal impairment or if they weigh less than 50 kilos, so the old, elderly, frail person, you should halve that. Occasionally, you need to increase it to 60 if they're someone with a huge body habitus where 40 is probably not doing the job and your pharmacist will probably be the one to suggest that to you and you'll be like, oh, great, great suggestion, let's just do that. Um, I rarely think about it myself. Um, therapeutic clexane dosing you can get really familiar with because it happens all the time. Um, basic, it's really easy. It's just based on weight. So as soon as someone needs to be started on therapeutic clexane, just make sure the nurses do an actual weight on the patient. Um, it's one milligram per kilogram twice a day. Very easy. Or one and a half once a day. And you would often swap people to that one if that you're going to be discharging them on Clexane. So someone that you're going to be starting on Clexane, bridging for warfarin while the warfarin becomes therapeutic, who's going to be on daily Clexane injections with hospital in the home, you might want them to be on the 1.5 daily instead of the um, one BD, just because the HIF nurse is not going to be coming to the house twice a day. It's much more convenient if they can go once. Um, therapeutic Clexane needs a level after the third dose, regardless of which way you've dosed it. The third dose will need a level afterwards. You'll get a reminder from either your pharmacist or your edge at some point that that's something that needs to happen. Um, renal impairment, it's just one. It's just this, but once a day. Um, is this the warfarin section? Yes, let's do warfarin. So um, it is your job to dose your patients with warfarin. Um, you can ask your edges if you're confused, but it's your job. So let's go through how to do that. First thing is what the actual brand is. So mo the large majority will be Coumadin, occasionally will be Maravan. Um, you need to know what the indication is, what their target RNR is, and it's gonna be two to three if it's AF the large majority of the time, but sometimes it'll be a little bit different for various reasons. Um, and what normal dose they take. The important thing to know about warfarin is that there's a two day lag from when the dose is taken to when it actually gets reflected in the INR because it works, you know, with the vitamin K and the antivirus and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lag for it until you actually see the effect. So basically, when you get an INR in hospital, that is based on the dose they took two days ago. So when you're dosing that, go slowly and keep that into account. Um, when you're first starting someone on warfarin, you also might not need to check their INR every day. You could just, you know, go, okay, let's just start with five and just check it in two days because the next day it's still not gonna be therapeutic, you've just started it and it hasn't been two days yet. So let's actually go through an example. And once again, there is no perfect answer. There's no correct answer. This is just me talking you through an approach, my approach of how you might think about things. So say you've got a patient that comes into hospital, they've got an INR of 1.5, they're normally on Coumadin, 4 AF, I target INR of two to three, and the usual dose is four milligrams. They've come in, they're like, no, I haven't missed any doses at all, whatever, yep. Um, but they do, their INR is 1.5. You go, okay, well, it's clearly not working. I might just increase their dose. So you chop them five milligrams for that first day. You get it the next day, it's still not therapeutic, but you've only just changed the dose. You're not going to increase it any further. It hasn't been two days yet. So you just stick with five milligrams. Next day at some point, you're like, okay, well, it's now been two days since I gave them five milligrams. They're not quite therapeutic yet. Maybe I'll increase it. You could go to six, you could go to 5.5 and go, I, do, I think that, you know, 5.5 might just be enough. There's no right or wrong answer. Let's say we go 5.5. Again, you do that for two days. And now we're like, oh, great, we're therapeutic. Let's stick with that then. Let's stick with 5.5. And that's working really well. But then the next day you get a really high level. Let's say you've just started the patient on amiodarone and you've got some, some other reason why there are some interactions and their INR goes really high. And you're just like, oh, okay. So uh, first thing is make sure they're not bleeding. Um, but uh, if the patient's clinically fine, you would just withhold the warfarin dose on that day. And I'll show you a great warfarin guideline for when it's super therapeutic in a minute. But you just withhold that one. <laughs> Next day, that's still super therapeutic, so it's still above three. You're probably still gonna withhold it again. Next day, it's 2.9, great. So now we're in our range, we're in the two to three range. So now you go, okay, well, what dose do I give now? 
technically that 2.9 is based on here, but there's still some warfarin in their system from before. So that's where the rule doesn't become, is not perfect. You might go, okay, well, five was kind of almost working, 5.5, we sort of got there, but looked like we were overshot it a little bit. Hard to say, you could pick either, to be honest. Let's say go with five. There's no, hard, there's no right or wrong. Hope that made some amount of sense. That's basically how you dose warfarin. Any questions? Yes. No. 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 Sometimes they'll have them and they'll have their three bottles. That's another one. When you discharge someone on warfarin, always discharge them on the five milligrams, the two milligrams, and the one milligram so that they've got options of their doses change. Um, so they should have all three bottles. And if they've physically brought their meds in, you might have all three bottles and you can be able to tell. I know that there is 11 to 1. I just don't know which one it is. That happens for li literally every medication where the patients will be like, this colour thing. And I just kind of go, I don't know medication colours. I just know how to write them. And then you just have a bit of a joke moment and go, great, I'll just have to figure it out later. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, GI stuff. Um, this is quite good for patients who've got chest pain that you think might be reflux related rather than cardiac um, and you want to see if it settles down. Um, the pink mix is a great one. So it's, it's actually myelanta slash gastrogel, which is this first line. I don't chart that as mag hydroxide blah. I just chart it as either myelanta or gastrogel, whichever one you have in your hospital, 20 oral stat or PRN. And then pink mix is just that, but also a little bit of lignocaine just to numb things, which can make people feel really good. So you can just write it down as pink mix. Some people colloquially call it pink lady. Um, so pink mix, 20 mils oral now. It gets used a lot in fast track in the ED for people who are trying to differentiate between types of pain. Pain that responds to pink mix doesn't necessarily mean it's not cardiac, which makes it a little bit of a weird one. And same thing, pain that responds to GTN doesn't necessarily mean it is cardiac but um on the wards it's a good way of just relieving indigestion symptoms having pink mix there cardiovascular drugs so um most of these peer patients are either going to already be on or it'll be reg driven in terms of you making any changes to it so you don't really have to know much about them metoprolol would be one you'd give on your own and that's if you're seeing someone who's in rapid af for any reason and my good rule of thumb there is to use a further dose of their usual dose. So if someone's on 25 BD, you can give an extra dose of 25. If they're on 50 BD, you can have given extra 50. So whatever their normal dose is, give them an extra dose of that same dose um, at the time that they have the rapid AF episode, and that's usually a good rule of thumb. If they're not normally on metoprolol, if they don't have a history of AF, maybe escalate. If they, if they do have a history of AF, but they're just not normally on metoprolol, maybe just go with 25 and see how that goes, but you can always go up. Um, fluid overload, um, furosemide is obviously our first point call. A good rule of thumb there is once again to convert what they're already on into IV. So if they're already on, say, 40 oral, converting to 40 IV when they're overloaded is a good way to start. And you guys would know that oral to IV is, 20 times, is twice as potent. So 40 of IV is actually the equivalent of 80 oral. But when someone's overloaded, you obviously want to give them more than what they're normally on. <laughs> so for someone who's coming in overloaded, going from the exact dose of what they're on orally as IV makes it twice as potent. It's also an IV route, which makes it more efficient. So that's a good place to start. And you can also use that as a stat dose if you're seeing someone on the wards. If they're normally on whatever it is oral, you can just use an extra stat dose IV of whatever they're normally on as a big a, a rule of thumb of where to start with what to give them for the overload that they currently have. If they're frusamide naive, maybe just go with 40 or 20 even if they're really small and frail. Um, obviously make sure that they've got the renal function and blood pressure to support the diuresis you're about to give them. Hypertension is actually a really common urgent clinical review and it's a really annoying one because the large majority of the time it's not an urgent review the large majority of the time it's chronic hypertension that has gone unchecked and is in no way a medical emergency so it's a really annoying one the cases where it is actually a medical emergency are very very few and far between and it's the people that have you know the dizziness the headache the strong cerebrovascular history and the blood pressure that's above 200 and that has shot up really quickly 
that's the large, that's, that's very, very few of the people that you will see for hypertension on the wards. The large majority, they've been sitting in the 160s, 180s most of their admission. Suddenly they've come up a little bit higher because suddenly they're in pain and it's an urgent clinical review because their leverage is like 200. Don't care. But anyway, <laughs> you have to do something because it's an urgent clinical review. So you, um, if, they're, if it's below 200, if they're asymptomatic, could just do nothing. If there's an antihypertensive that's been withheld, you can restart it. Um, if, uh, if, yeah, if, it, if it's within a range that you'd be happy, then you could just put a note for the home team to start them on something regular the next day because it's clearly a chronic issue rather than an acute issue. If you do want to lower it, I think a good place to start is a GTM patch because it's something that you can titrate really quickly. So you can put a five milligrams per 24 hour tw um, GTM patch uh, first and put down in your order please remove when systolic blood pressure hits below whatever I often go 140 but whatever so you've got a plan for them to remove the patch and it will stop having an effect straight away once you're happy with the blood pressure and that means that you're not going to have a risk of it going down too low so make sure that if you do chart a patch that you've got a plan to when to remove <laughs> it just to protect yourself and to make it safe um, some people use amlodipine as a stat thing to bring down blood pressure. I question the appropriateness of that. It is done a lot, but tech, I mean, this is a medication for long-standing hypertension. If you're genuinely worried about someone's acute blood pressure, then you should probably use something that's going to bring it down acutely, is my take. But you might get, start using amlodipine because everyone else is doing it around you, and that's fine. I would suggest you here. Diabetes. Um, Again, the people will come in on all of these things and if there's any changes, it'll be reg-driven. The one that you guys should be comfortable using is Nova Rapid for people that are getting hyperglycemia in hospital. Um, and a good one there is a sliding scale. Who has not heard of a sliding scale before? Great, you've all used them. So it's basically when you, this is what they end up looking like on a paper drug chart. You, so it can take a little while to write down because you've got to write all of this, right? where depending on what someone's BSL is, you have decided how many units they should have. So if their BSL is 10 to 14, give them four units. If it's 14 to 18, give them six units. And, they, and this is just taken from these numbers that are over here of how many units to give, okay? Um, but this isn't a hard and fast rule and sometimes I just invent the numbers. I just go, yep, uh, four units if it's between 14 and 6, 20, and then yeah, you can kind of figure out how many units you want to give them. Um, but when you're starting off, if you want a bit of a guideline, you can use these ones if you like. Um, the important thing here is make it TDS, not willy-nilly any time in the day, and make it with meals. So the, what should happen with a sliding scale is that the nurses check the BSL immediately before they have a meal. It's either low or high or whatever it is. And then they give the sliding scale Nova Rapid from their <coughs> chart with the meal. So they're actually having food while they're having this insulin, okay? And that's quite important. If you get paged about someone's blood sugar outside of a meal time, say you're on night cover, if you're in one of the hospitals that does that as interns, or if it's middle of the afternoon, and for some reason they've had a blood sugar done, um, if it's high, put the Nova, and, and if you want to treat it, which you might decide not to, you might decide just wait until the meal, and if it's still high, then they can have their sliding scale. That's perfectly reasonable. But if it's very high and you're like, okay, maybe I'll do something about it, if you want to treat it, Put it as a stat order. Don't tell them to give it off the um, sliding scale chart. It's a separate thing. Write it as a stat order. And be careful with doing that as well with the risk of hypo. So if I do write a stat order of Nova Rapid, I go really conservative. I uh, don't give too much. And the other thing is to remember how long Nova Rapid actually takes. Um, it can actually take a long time to reach its peak effect. So if someone's rechecked the um, BSL an hour after and it's still high, you, you can actually make them go hyper if you give them a second dose because it might just be that that first one hasn't reached its full peak yet. So don't stack Nova rapid doses or you might get your patient to a hypo. Um, that would be my other rule about Nova rapid. So make sure that your starting scale is always with meals, TDS, and make sure that if you give extra units, you write them as a stat dose and only one at a time would be my rules. These are all excellent choices as starting doses and I think you should just follow all of those. They're great. 
The only thing I would change is make sure medical acrylamide has that max dose of 60 milligrams for 24 hours. But otherwise, these are all very appropriate starting doses if you're starting people on palliative medications as PRNs to put down. Um, the thing with, with um, palliative care is um, I often don't put a max dose and I don't put a frequency. Or if I do, I just make it one hourly um, because they die. If they need more pain relief to die in, without pain, then that's fine. They should just have that. Cool. Any questions about any of that? Let's move on. Now, fluids, I feel like people freak out about and it gets overly complicated all of the time when it's actually really simple. So I want to simplify it as much as I possibly can. And I know that I'm saying that and I'm about to show a really busy slide, but only this bit, only this bit is the fluid bit, right? <laughs> all of this is about electrolytes and we'll come back to that. But this tiny little section at the bottom is about fluids. It's tiny, it's really easy. So. You all remember that thing from peds where, you know, the four milligrams, the first turn of body weight, blah, blah, blah. It, it's a vague estimate of what someone's maintenance fluids are, fine. Um, but in reality, in adult patients, if you use that rule, it's going to be somewhere between eight and ten hourly litre bags, basically. So if you have as a rule of thumb that for an adult human, that having a litre bag of something running over anywhere from eight to ten hours is going to be roughly maintenance, that's probably a good rule of thumb. And the other thing is, you're very, very, very rarely going to have to have someone on full maintenance fluids for multiple days at a time. You're either going to have someone on fluids because they're fasting for theatre and they're not eating anything, in which case they're then they're going to have their theatre and they're going to be able to eat, so they're going to be on maintenance for maximum 12 hours, or if they get cancelled, then they will eat, and then you do the fasting again. So again, it's not full maintenance. Um, or they're very rapidly going to get some alternative form of feeding, like an enzyme gastric tube or TPN or something else. So full maintenance fluids of someone is only getting their fluid from fluids that you've charted is exceedingly rare. So that all of that stress about charting the maintenance fluids, get rid of it. The large majority of the time, you will be charting one single eight hourly bag of fluid, and that'll be enough. Okay? And that can just be CSL the large majority of the time. Done. Sorted. Fluids. We'll go into a bit more detail. <laughs> um, so, eight or ten hourly, you go slower if they're a small, frail patient that you're worried will get overloaded. Any crystalloid works, so CSL, normal saline, or fax and dextrose. All good choices. Um, you can also have the dextrose with 30 um, millimoles of potassium in there as well, if you also are sort of worried about electrolytes as an alternative option, but all of those are good maintenance options. When you're dealing with resuscitation fluids, um, obviously you're trying to replace what is being lost. So if someone's losing blood, you should be giving them blood. If they're getting an acidic tap and they're losing that, you should be giving them albumin, that sort of thing. Um, my general approach is just think about how dehydrated they actually seem and how dehydrated you, you expect them to continue to be. So if they're gonna be fasting for a long amount of time and they're dehydrated now, you might chart them a little bit more than if they're dehydrated now, but they're gonna be eating and drinking for the rest of the admission. They don't have any nausea and they'll be fine to do that on their own. Um, the only difference to the fluid choices from maintenance is not to use dextrose as a resuscitation fluid because it equilibrates across all body compartments and therefore is not an appropriate choice for someone who's hypertensive or you're trying to increase their blood pressure. So don't use dextrose as a recess fluid, use normal saline or CSL. Um, and the only thing I would guess I would add with fluid choice, especially when you're giving people multiple bags, is don't just keep on giving them the same fluid. Vary it, because each of them have their issues if you use them um, alone. So if you use normal saline only, then you're gonna get them hypochloremic and therefore acidotic. If you only use CSL, they're gonna have lots of lactate. Um, if you only use 5% dextrose, they're going to just have no electrolytes. So make sure that you're varying your fluid choice. That previous slide actually has quite a good general rule about, uh, it keeps on getting cropped off, about the amount of sodium and potassium someone should have over the course of a day. So making sure that they're getting vaguely enough, specifically potassium, the sodium should roughly be all right if you're swapping around between bags. Just keeping a vague eye on that if you are writing multiple um, bags in a row. But just as a general, just vary them. You might go, you know, normal sign for your first bag and then 
see a selfie a second bag and if that's all you're writing down it's probably fine okay so as a bit of an example of an approach say you're getting a th you're seeing a 30 year old man late in the afternoon in ed they're hypotensive they're dehydrated they just haven't eaten much over the last few days because they've had appendicitis surgeons have seen them they've been admitted they're going to have surgery in the morning but they're going to start fasting from midnight so they're not quite fasting yet but they're just not eating a huge amount so you're going to want to give them some resuscitation fluids because they're hypertensive and dehydrated so you want to actually replete the fluid first off so your first bag might be either of the resuscitation fluids doesn't really matter um you're probably not going to put anything else in it and then it depends on how dehydrated you think you are if you want to give it stat and give it all of it now you can give it over now you can give it over two hours there's no hard and fast rule just depending on how dehydrated you think you are just go from there. Um, stat is usually fine if they're actually hypertensive and they're young. Then you might go, okay, and then I'm already going to write a second bag for when that's done. And okay, let's say I gave normal saline the first time, I might put CSL the second time, no additive again. Pick your rate, it doesn't matter. Okay? And this is sort of serving the role of maintenance as well as resuscitation fluid at this rate because they're still not really having much fluid themselves. So some of this is going to fall into the, the maintenance category, but then you're still sort of topping up a little bit as you go. So you might go, okay, and then after my stat bag, let's put like a four hourly bag just to sort of continue to rehydrate them, but it just doesn't have to be quite so fast because now they shouldn't be quite so hypertensive. And then you could stop there if you think that that's probably enough. You could organize for someone to review them at that point, or you could just could say, okay, if their blood pressure is still blah, give this next bag, or you could just write a third bag. There's, there's no hard and fast rule. It completely depends on your own judgment of that situation. You might decide you want to put a maintenance bag as the next one. You could go for CSL, you could go for dextrose with 30 mils of KCL, and you could just make it last for maintenance amounts of times. That's fine. There is absolutely no rule to this. It is all based on judgment, but those are just some general principles, okay? Now, the electrolyte side of things, it is complicated, but you don't actually need to know a huge amount about all of this. The really complicated one is the sodium, but that's a reg level thing. You don't have to, you're not gonna be managing hyper and hyponatremia on your own, nor should you. You should be calling people about that because it's more complicated than just which fluid you give. So don't worry about having to deal with that alone, you don't. Um, and um, hyper and hyperkalemia, if it's extreme and if there's ECG changes, and you can always look up the ECG changes when you see the ECGs to remind yourself of what you should be looking out for, that's fine. Um, if, you're, if it's concerning extremes, then yeah, get help, definitely. If it's within the realms of something you think you can manage, like if it's only sort of one outside of the range of normal, then maybe deal with it on your own. Um, specifically if it's hypokalemia, which is the most common thing you see in hospital, a lot of the surgical units and cardiology as well want the potassium above four as a general rule, even though the range is 3.5 to 4.5, they often like above four. So the tools up in your arsenal are slow K or clovescent as one or two tablets, either stat or once a day, twice a day, it doesn't really matter. You're going to be very used to using these next year, trust me. Um, if you do want it to go up faster, then you can give it IV. I'll show you how that's charted in the next slide. Someone is hyperkalemic. Your first point of call can just be rhizomium, just to try and get a little bit lower. Um, otherwise, some other options include fruzamide, dextrose with act rapid, so you're trying to get the potassium into cells, or some salbutamol or nebs, which we've already seen how to chart, so that's quite an easy one to do. If it's in, within the realms of something that you're not comfortable dealing with, and just ask for help, and that's absolutely fine. And no one will begrudge you needing help to deal with someone who's hyperkalemic. Um, magnesium is often one that teams also like their magnesium being above one. Again, the normal range is much lower than that, but teams really like magnesium being above one. So just knowing how to chart a magnesium tablet or magnesium IV can also be quite helpful. That's literally all I would highlight on this slide. Really don't worry too much about it. So IV replacement, which especially on surgical units, you're gonna use a lot. What we colloquially call mini bags, is normal saline 100 mils with 10 millimoles of whichever one you're dealing with, so KCL or magnesium sulfate. The one thing is you have to give that over an hour. Can't go any faster than that because you don't want the K to go up too fast. Um, you can also give that in the bag that we were talking about before, the bag we were talking about before with the 30 millimoles. 
Um, there's a very vague rule where potassium goes up by 0.1 for every mini bag, but that's extremely variable because it depends on how much intracellular potassium they've got and all these sorts of things. So I would sometimes write down two or three bag, mini bags down at once, never more. Check it after that. Okay. So some resources you can use for all of that. Therapeutic guidelines is very good. Can I change tabs? Is that all right? Therapeutic guidelines is very good for when you know your indication. So if you Google pneumonia and you get brought to this page, then you might get a good, um, what is the etiology, blah, 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 blah. Empirical therapy based on severity, great. And you click there and it gives you exactly what doses to use, how frequently, what, why to use one over another, et cetera. So therapeutic guidelines is excellent for um, antibiotic choices. Um, and most hospital guidelines are based on this. So great resource to use for um, when you have an indication and you just want to know what to treat it with. AMH is really good when you know the medication you want to use, um, but you, want to, you don't remember what the dosage is or you don't remember how to chart it or you don't remember what precautions you need to take or if you need to halve the dose for renal impairment or those sorts of things. Um, so you, you look up the drug and it'll give you, you know, what to use. Sometimes it'll give you what to use for different indications as well. Um, and then at the bottom, it'll also give you what form it comes in. So when you're writing scripts, especially if you're somewhere that does them with paper, this can be helpful for writing your scripts. And it also gives you a link to the PBS website, um, especially for medications that need approval numbers and streamlined authorities and all that sort of stuff. So that's a good place to come to for when you're writing scripts. Um, when I'm, when I'm working in places that are not the Austin that use paper things, these two tabs are open all the time. So use them. And this was the one I was telling you about before with the um, elevated INR. So it, it's, you literally just Google warfarin um, guideline Red Cross and it gives you a great guideline of um, what to do if patients are bleeding or not bleeding and with high, or high INRs in different ranges on warfarin with blah, 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 blah. Tells you what to give, how much to give, whether to stop the warfarin, whether to reverse it, all that sort of stuff. So won't click through all of it, but just know that that resource is there. It's a great resource. Just aware of time, I'm gonna try and speed up a bit. Okay, that's it of the long section of prescribing. Um, couple of apps to download that I think are useful. Feel free to just take a photo of that. This is my phone and the apps that I use. Um, MD calc being the most frequently used one. The eye chart thing is great because it actually brings up a Snellen chart and if you have it at arm's length, that should about be like the normal vision. So if someone can read it at arm's length and then it's fine. I find that one quite useful for ED. The opioid calculator is quite good when you can put down all of someone's opioids in there, like the patches they're on and all of this sort of stuff. And it'll give you the daily oral morphine equivalent of what they're on. And if you want to swap them to a different opioid, it's quite easy to do. Okay. The last section is on met calls and urgent clinical reviews, which is something that we're going to be practicing in the next section. So all that I will be talking about is just giving you a bit of an approach. And we're just going to go through some of the differentials of each of the different types of urgent clinical reviews. And then all the practice will be afterwards. So it'll be practice going through all of these and with all of the prescribing and fluid management and all that sort of stuff that we were doing just before. So a quick reminder, the whole point of urgent clinical reviews and medicals is to prevent cardiac arrest um, and deterioration and death. So what we're trying to prevent is the 4Hs and 4Ts of cardiac arrest. Um, so hypoxia, hypovolemia, et cetera, you know all of these. I like, quite like that comes from um, the ALS um, books, that sort of diagram. I find it quite visually helpful if you're a visual learner. Um, this is what we're trying to prevent when we're doing these things. Um, so with urgent clinical reviews, or some places call them pre-met calls, first thing is know what your protocol is. When I was working in Mildura, they had a 10 minute rule where you had to attend your urgent clinical review in 10 minutes, which I thought was ridiculous, but it's a tiny hospital. Um, most places it'll be half an hour. You can call ahead. So nurses should include a number in their pages so that you can call and find out more information about the urgent clinical review. Um, in Mildura that didn't, which was extra fun. Um, 
So it can be, especially if you're really, really busy, it can be really helpful to call ahead, get a bit of extra information. And that can help you triage how important it is and whether you get there in half an hour or whether you get there now um, in terms of how worried you actually are about it or if it's someone that's just always got high blood pressure. Um, and you can also get them to start doing things. So if it's someone who's got chest pain or tachycardia, you can ask them to do an ECG so that it's already there by the time you get there. If they've got something on their PRN chart that's relevant to the urgent clinical review, so say if it's someone who's sick and you're saying, oh, are they wheezy? Yep, do they have subunit on their chart? Just give them some. Then you can sort of start the management before you get there, and that way you can assess whether it's worked when you actually get there. So... Um, and making sure that they've had a full set of bulbs by the time you get there and all those sorts of things. So it can help you find out more information to know how to triage it and it can help you start dealing with the issue to save yourself some time and to make sure the patient gets dealt with quickly if you're going to be a while before you get there as well. Um, when you do your review, make sure you document everything including a plan. And I think what's quite important with an urgent clinical review is what your impression is. And that can be really vague. It doesn't have to be a diagnosis. It can be unclear cause of tachycardia, you know, query dehydration, query pain, not concerning, you know, review PRN, whatever it is. It, it can just be, look, I'm not sure what's going on, but I'm not worried. These are the things I'm thinking about and I'm not worried. Just make sure that someone who's reading your notes can sort of tell what your thinking was, especially if you've done an urgent clinical review on one of your own patients and then someone sees that because they've had another deterioration overnight and they don't know the patient as well, sort of knowing what the home team was thinking can be quite helpful. And this goes for water notes as well, actually. Just knowing, being able to, to show in your notes what the home team is thinking can be really helpful. And another thing I would suggest with your urgent clinical reviews, especially when you're on a cover shift, is having a plan for when to re-escalate. So that can be, you know, um, give salbutamol, um, recheck respirate in one hour. If stool high, can give another one. Um, if stool high after that, please recall UCR or criteria altered for two hours to allow time for metropolol to take effect. Um, if, you know, back in UCR criteria after two hours, please call again or whatever it is. And you can have a few different steps of if it's stool blood, you know, at this time then give another dose of this or give this other thing that I've charted or give the magnesium that I've written down or whatever it is. Um, and that saves you from going back to see this patient five times when you've got a whole bunch of other things to do. So make a multi-step plan that people can follow and try and practice that in this afternoon as well. So my approach to actually assessing an urgent clinical review patient, and I'm quick care minded, so I definitely have a quick care approach and the whole end of bed, do they look sick, do they look not sick, I actually think it's so useful. And that tells you whether your approach will be more of a history examination approach or if you're going to go for an ADCD approach. Just if you look at the end of bed, do they look like crap or do they look like they're on their phone and they're fine and you're not worried about them. And then you can find out a bit of information before you go in. So you can ask the nurse, why'd you call the UCR? What do you know about the patient? Are you worried, etc.? Look at their notes, see what their past history is and what the most recent note from the home team has been. Look at all of their ARBs and are they actually met criteria and should this be a met call? But also just, are there, is there more than one off? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. This will only be like two more minutes. Um, and then you go through your ABCD assessment, your history. I think the most important thing is just have a mental list of your differentials and make sure that the most, like, you've thought of what the most likely thing is, but also the really serious one that you wouldn't want to miss make sure that you're sufficiently happy that that has either been ruled out or that you're taking steps towards that. So very, very, very quickly, hypertension and shock. You know that your different differentials are based on whether it's obstructive, hypovolemic, distributive or pump failure. So think about it in terms of those terms. The ones that have stars are part of the 4-H's and 4-T's. Hey, by the way, the ones that have little brackets are causes of hypertension but rarely of shock. Bradycardia is rarely an issue. The large majority of the time, it's just normal for the patient. The one to worry about is heart block, especially if it's second or third degree. First is usually fine. Um, and making sure that they're not on drugs that are going to exacerbate whatever the issue is. But most of the time, if it's asymptomatic, um, and especially if it's old, you don't care too much. Respiratory distress, you would know that you've got your pulmonary, cardiovascular, neuromuscular causes and then miscellaneous other things. Anxiety is a really big one and once this is again where your communication de-escalation skills are really really valuable. 
I've got a few in there for cough and hemoptysis as well, which is other things that you might have to see. A lot of them are the same as these ones and you've just got a couple of extra ones like gourd for cough. A pink lady can be very helpful for someone who's got cough. Um, and hemoptysis, don't forget that pneumonia can be a common cause. And epistaxis as well. Chest pain, you would all remember all of this. You've got the cardiovascular, the GI causes, the risk and chest wall causes. Um, anxiety is going to be a really, really common one in hospital as well. Met calls. I think there are quite a few different roles that you can take as the intern. Um, you can be handing over to the Met team what you know about the patient. And if you don't know the patient, um, if you're covering, then having all of the information, having the folder right there, having all their investigations and just giving all of the information to the Met team as you find it out. So going, oh, their OBS were this earlier or this is what their investigations are showing at the moment. This is what the home team thought this morning. So just sort of the information gathering person documenting can be your role as well. And my approach there is actually I just write down as an ABCD. So A, often I just tick. B, I write down the relevant OBS and the examination that we've done, plus or minus anything that we've um, given them and just kind of document it that way and then have a bit of an impression, what we're doing about it, and then just kind of keep a dynamic of, you know, we found out extra information or extra things have happened and just kind of follow down from there. Or you could be more of a, have more of a procedural role. Just be flexible and dynamic in that process and just try and be helpful how you can. They're actually great opportunities to learn, I think. After a med call, it's most often going to be your job to uh, follow up on things. So make sure that you are really clear on what the plan is and make sure that you are asking the MET team what the plan is if they haven't been clear about it. So what are we trying? You know, basically, whatever I told you to document for an urgent clinical review for nurses, make sure the MET team has done that for you. Saying, when do I re-escalate? What can I try next? When, do you want me to call you again? If, you know, make sure that you're very clear on the plan. Make sure someone's documented it, even if it wasn't you. And make sure that you hand over either to the night person, to the home team. Make sure that the people that are normally look after this patient um, know about it. So that's pretty much it. Um, we'll be going to the workshop very soon. A um, couple of final things. Try and learn things as you go in intern year. So look up conditions as they come up and those sorts of things. You're not going to feel like doing it when you get home. So just find two minutes to just go on up to date and go, oh, that's right. That was that condition that did this. Don't study. Take a break for intern year. If you want to do courses and research, if you already know what you want to do, great. Don't feel like you have to. Make sure that you're doing other things. It's going to feel like you have no work life balance at some points. Make sure that you've got those things that you can hang on to that make you feel like you again. And just my own little spiel is teaching feels great and it keeps you very fresh. So do some teaching of the students and the teams. Good luck, guys.